You are listening to the To and Out CFL Podcast, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. Good thing we're not live because it's take three. Travis Curra, Sheldon Jones, the To and Out CFL Podcast coming out of Labor Day weekend in Canada. And I just have a huge smile on my face. Well, first of all, this episode of To and Out is brought to you by Advil Muscle and Joint Extra Strength. It is keeping me going, brother. So thank you uh, to, to the good people at Advil for doing what they do. Uh, <laughs> I got a big smile on my face just because I know they say the CFL season starts at Labor Day and in a way it's it's crap but in another way <laughs> all of the insults being thrown at each other online okay I, I guess it's Labor Day I guess the season is underway everything counts but everything now counts just a little bit more Sheldon Oh, yeah, it's going to be a crazy rest of the season because now it's pretty much just inter-squad games. There's no more East-West games, I don't think. And uh, wow, it's it's go time. It is go time in the CFL. Yeah, I want to read uh, this email that Grant sent to the show, toandout.ca. You can send through the mailbag feature on the website. He's in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. A huge BC Lions fan. Says he loves the podcast, thanks us for the work, and he also loves Metallica. He just listened to the album Load the other day. Uh, he's got to work. Well, he had to work for the Sunday games, as it's Monday here, he says. And then, uh, hey, he's happy that CFL.ca has games on demand. Uh, he must have ris- written about a dozen letters to the league about that. So he wishes all Canadians and us a happy Labor Day weekend and thanks us for the pod. That's pretty cool. Grant with the connection to the CFL in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, maybe the next site of To and Out Live. Um, I had a big Labor Day weekend myself. So Saturday night, my wife and I get out to Commonwealth Stadium to see Pink live. That was crazy. I, she's an amazing performer. If you ever get the chance, please go and, and, and check out her show. But one of the takeaways I have from the show is that once you get 40,000 inebriated women in a stadium, they are much better behaved than 40,000 inebriated men, as it was uh, demonstrated after Metallica at Commonwealth Stadium. They lift each other up. They're complimenting each other on the trains. Like, it, w- it was crazy. They're, they're just so nice to each other. The guys are fighting and closing down LRTs by puking. And, and I think we had this chat. <laughs> we had this chat Labor Day. I feel like... Women can get after it, too, and get after the booze a little bit. But I feel Mm -hmm. like it's usually like one out of maybe a group that goes a little too far. And it's four guys. It's usually all four daring each other to go further. So this is also why women do live longer than us, too. Yep. Yeah, there's usually only one sloppy Susan of the group. (laughs) Uh, But but all the guys, you know, you get the marker out and then you're you're marking off every drink. And I've been there and it does not end well. So uh, I was happy to watch two shows of Metallica sober, though. That was uh, that was good for me. Yeah, I'm getting too old to drink, man. Yeah, and hey, I I don't I got enough adrenaline going at a Metallica show that uh, any of the uh, other outside substances don't help. Uh, <laughs> as, that you've tried so far, that you've yeah, tried. That I've, yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm open minded. Um, <laughs> we start uh, our Labor Day weekend recap with uh, that week 13 kickoff in Victoria, BC. The BC Lions basically just routing the Ottawa Red Blacks 38 to 12. Matthew Betts back with the team. Uh, he gets a sack. It Honestly, man, it just looked like a completely different BC Lions team that we've seen uh, during this uh, losing skid. Yeah, this was the BC Lions team that I think everyone just assumed was going to happen right that first game that Rourke came back there, just thinking he was going to go back to 
you know, mid season form of a couple of years ago, but it, it took some time to get the rust off. It took some time to get, to build up that consistency. The, uh, the, it just, it just takes time. You can't, if you, it's one thing for Matthew Betts to get back and to get into swing of things, but you're just rushing the quarterback and you just have to know, you know, what am I doing on this play? Uh, it's a little bit different when you're the quarterback and you got to get back into a rhythm with some new receivers, some, some of the same, but, um, yeah, uh, I, this is the one game I, I didn't pick right. I think, no, no, I picked the Argos too. Never mind. This is the only uh, game I picked right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that and, and like we said before, that's a long travel. It's even longer because, you know, they auto had to fly to Vancouver and then they probably had to take a ferry over to, to Victoria. I doubt they were flying straight in. But who knows? I guess with the chartered planes, they could have. I, I, uh, I think they probably made it a direct flight, yeah. but it's still. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the Lions are so from and Rourke was clearly on a mission. Uh, we saw yeah. the way that he reacted oh, wow. to the scores he was getting. I think he had. Uh, yeah, he had the rushing touchdown that uh, you could tell he was fired up like he was almost yeah. so excited he fell over. And then every celebration <laughs> and every touchdown after. After that, I mean, he's playing in front of friends and family for the first time as a pro, like at home. So he was clearly fired up. I, let's just get to it, man. Like, wh- what did you think about the halftime non-interview and then the subsequent comments afterwards? Because I read that and there were some passive aggressive <laughs> yeah. feelings there, too. Yeah, so I definitely have feelings as well, and and it's fifty fifty. Like in the moment, like I kind of laugh. I sent out a tweet being like, "Oh, Mister Marketing doesn't want to talk," which, you know, in jest. But uh, so I'm kind of fifty fifty on this. At first, I thought it was hilarious because uh, it was unexpected, and uh, you know, typically players give that stupid cliche. You know, we just gotta. I know this isn't a hockey podcast, but you know, pucks on the net, you know, stuff like that. So. Uh, on one hand, it was good seeing something unexpected. It wasn't as good as, you know, Solomon L. William, uh, you know, Beacon, Henry Burris or whatever it was. <laughs> Nothing that will happened. top that. That was <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, well, the, the punt hitting the scoreboard, I think, topped it. But... <laughs> <laughs> or the spider cam <laughs> Which, being stuck. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Spider kid. <laughs> Andre, we love you. Uh <laughs> um, but uh, so so on one hand, I thought it was OK. I thought it was funny, different. But on the other hand, this guy is getting paid a ton of money for marketing. And that is part of marketing. And, you know, he he all he had to do was give those cliche answers. But that's putting his face on national television, on a game that is getting extra eyes because it's touchdown Pacific. Uh, and then the comments after the game saying that, you know, I only did it because the coach said he wouldn't make me do it the whole rest of the season. And I hate halftime interviews like buddy. And and, and I say this to, to fans and I think this of rider quarterbacks when they come to town because it's a fishbowl, but you're, you just signed the highest paid contract, you know, in years, you are now the face of the CFL, whether you like it or not. And you're getting paid a bunch of money that doesn't count towards the cap for marketing. So you need to learn to like to do these interviews and you need to learn to, you know, get through them, whether you like them or not. So, yeah. uh, again, 50 50. But hopefully he learns from this. Hopefully he kind of I, I understand there was extra pressure on him because it was in Victoria and Glenn Suter had to tell us 69 times that he's from Van- nice. or from Victoria. Um I was joking with Tammy about doing the drinking game, but there's no way we would have made it to the end of the fourth quarter if we did that. Uh, but uh, like, so I get it. This, this was a week that was extra pressure on him, but you know, look, he performed excellent except for like, you know, third quarter wasn't so great, but they got back, he got back into it. But th- this is the work that we all were hoping was going to get back here. So now, you know, we need to see him embrace that marketing side a little bit more. Yeah, and I guess I'm kind of conflicted too, and I, I wish I could take a solid, you know, position on it, but I know that these interviews 98% of the time are just straight up cliche. So what what yeah. kind of value do they provide? But at the same time, it's, it's part of the gig. And mm-hmm. I guess yeah. I, I think... You know, there are a lot of players that are probably shy and 
Uh, you know, they, they don't like, you know, being in front of them. I'm not saying that about Nathan, but hey, maybe a fullback like, uh, I don't know, David Mackey. <laughs> maybe he would like the opportunity for some people to see his face and get a little bit known. But yeah, that, Rourke is like, you want him to be the face of the league, the face of the team. And that's just part of it. And I do appreciate Farhan Lauji like bringing back the curtain a little bit. Like he has personally said, like I, I, I know he doesn't like him, so I'm not going to request him. And then they said, well, the story is his performance at home, so we got to request him. And they got that. And then, you know, at the end of the game, he's saying, hey, I, I talk to you guys even if you take me away from my family, which was like, wow. <laughs> He's clearly fired up, and hey, if he's yeah. going to use that to uh, fire himself up for BC Lions fans, I, I guess uh, good for them, right? <laughs> it's good for them, but, you know, next year he's going to be making eight hundred grand, and that's putting food on the table for your family. So uh, I... And, and this isn't even a quarterback, but I just remember a story, uh, and it, it's it has that exact quote in it. So, you know, this was 10, 15 years ago when Matt Dominguez was still with the Rough Riders. And there was, it was right around this time of year, too, because it was the Rider Fan Day, the day before Labor Day. And, you know, we're on the field at Old Taylor Field getting autographs. And at that point in time, the biggest, like, it, there wasn't tables set up. It was just riders standing all over on the field. And there was this giant halo of fans, myself included, right around Matt Dominguez. And it was getting to the end of the time that they were supposed to be there. And he was signing, signing, signing. And his wife came over because I guess they had something to do. And she's like, Matt, we got to go. We got to go. And he's like, hey, you know what? I know we got to go. But these guys pay, these guys put food on our tables. So I'm signing every single autograph and then we'll get out of here. And and he's not even the quarterback of the team that like the quarterback in the CFL and especially a Canadian quarterback, who's the highest paid player. You under you have to understand that's, that's part of the, what you have to give up to be that person, to be on that pedestal. Hey, and we still see Dominguez jerseys in Saskatchewan. So uh, yep. that guy made some fans. Um, yeah. If we talk just on the on the field stuff, uh, the the problem with Ottawa is they, they couldn't stay on the field. It's just as simple as that. Like you look at the first drive from yeah. BC, eight plays, sixty five yards, a hundred or uh, four minutes and twenty eight seconds off the clock. So it's seven nothing early, and then it's a two and out. Thanks Ottawa, but Thanks. then the the very <laughs> next uh, drive. It's 11 plays, 89 yards for the Lions. Six minutes off the clock. You're already down two scores. And and then the Lions have forced Ottawa to be one-dimensional. And yep. the Lions this year, and I think if this is a positive that we've seen like during the skid, they're not one-dimensional right now. There were times when they just blatantly refused to run and now they really have stand back going he got 20 carries 93 yards but then he added another 78 yards receiving the, the guy's an animal and he's on a roll right now and this is now with Nathan Rourke uh, at quarterback who himself had almost 30 yards rushing so the, the Lions offense, they're starting to get rolling again. And got to watch them down the stretch. Like, I know some Lions fans were starting to panic <laughs> a little bit once yeah. they got into that losing skid. But, yeah, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with down the stretch. Oh, yeah. No, that's this is exactly the team that we saw the first five games of the season uh, when VA was playing good before he got hurt. Um, it's it's good because, you know, there's going to be a, a, a huge stadium that's full on Grey Cup Sunday. And, and imagine if, if BC is there, it's going to be just an electric atmosphere. So uh, buckle up. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest, uh, we lost you for about 15 seconds, so don't oh, know what you cool. said, but now you're back, uh, and we are buckled up. Um, 
<laughs> for the rest of the season. Um, uh, so in the third quarter, um, it it was thirty one six Lions. Um, yeah. And then Rourke ends up throwing an interception, and then the very next play, it's a touchdown for Dominic Rhymes. So 31-12 was the score for the Lions, and that was about all Ottawa could really muster there. So, And I think mm-hmm. we've actually seen it uh, many times this season where a team goes into the half with a big lead, and then in the third quarter, the trailing team starts to fight back and get back. We saw yeah. it in the Saskatchewan-Winnipeg game, which we will get to. And then, you know, the team that's in the lead finally sticks it out there the hole was just too big for Ottawa to climb out of but uh hey Matthew Betts I I mentioned him got a sack and I I really think that the injuries to the receiving core in Ottawa yeah it's gonna take a while for them to adjust to that it's as simple as that they got Dominic Rimes uh you know four catches 46 yards Justin Hardy four for 49 and Eli Stove, uh, the leading receiver uh, for the Red Blacks, 8 for 73. But uh, once they took Rock Armstead out of the game really early, he only had seven carries for 24 yards, really a non-factor for the Red Blacks. And I think they are at their best when they are physical and they are running you over and using that rushing attack and getting down that early and that fast against the Lions really took it away. And wasn't there a moment in the game where Devontae Dedman had a big return uh, called back due to penalty? Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> those are just deflating. Like You can't recover from like some special teams is one of those things where, hey, it's cool if you get a big play and get into good field position or get a score. And again, it happened in the Saskatchewan Winnipeg game. Once yeah. the blunders happen, that's just almost something that it just crushes any momentum you have hope to build. Yeah, um, whether it's a fumble, whether it's a, just a big penalty that takes back a return, it just kills your momentum. That kind of wraps up the BC Ottawa touchdown Pacific. I am, I guess, interested to see if and where there's going to be a neutral site game next year. Are they going to do Pacific again, yeah. or what are they going to do there? I, I, I was thinking, man. Selfishly, I'd love one in Red Deer. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, But, I mean, I don't think Saskatchewan, I don't think they would ever give up a home game to do it in Saskatoon, which I think would be cool. But maybe there are some other locations in Ontario or Atlantic, or maybe they just continue to do the BC thing. Like, uh, I think one of Doman's things is that he just wants the team to belong to all of British Columbia. And yeah. I mean, BC is such a massive, massive province. Uh, whether you're, you know, the interior, the lower main, lower, the island, like there's so many different places. Um, but yeah. I, I, I do like the idea of these neutral. Well, they're not really neutral, especially in the case of uh, BC. Um, but mm-hmm. man, I'd love to attend one of them. That's for sure. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe they could go a little bit more in mainland and they could go to, like, Okanagan or, you know... That'd be sweet. Somewhere, like, somewhere else to just try to tap into the eastern part of, of BC. Uh, a Red Deer game would be cool. They did Fort Mac once, right? Yeah. I think yeah. they did a game in Fort Mac. That was, <laughs> like, the that Argos was pretty cool. were actually the home team against Edmonton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mike Riley breaks his leg... <laughs> He comes back after Labor Day. They win 10 in a row and they win the Grey Cup. But, yeah, they did, uh, I think, a Ryder-Edmonton preseason game and then an Argos-Edmonton regular season game. Mm -hmm. So they did a couple. I could see maybe them trying Quebec. Uh, I just don't know if, if, you know, Pierre Carl would want to give up a home game to test a Quebec market for a team that would be... right immediately become their rival right but uh but a montreal quebec rivalry would be pretty awesome I it think. would i agree i totally agree uh with that 
We'll talk about the Sunday uh, Labor Day weekend game, and that is the Blue Bombers beating the Rough Riders 35-33. Where do we start with this thing? Uh <laughs> <laughs> like, Wayne's World was fun. Uh, hey, was there was it? no was wasps. It? Yeah, there's no. The wasps were were okay. The, the, was there a game? I forgot about that. <laughs> now, it was a good game. The I guess the highest attendance ever at New Mosaic Stadium because they were selling standing room tickets, which is pretty cool. Um, but mm-hmm. when I talk about the rivalry and things becoming personal, this is the game where. <laughs> Some things were boiling over, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I guess we'll get to that. We'll start with uh, Winnipeg here, who clearly came out with a brilliant game plan in the first half and clearly saw some holes down the middle of the field and made mm-hmm. the riders pay. Two big completions, one the touchdown to Nick Dembski and one the big completion to Ontario Wilson there. And the Riders had no answer for that in the first half. So the Bombers go into the room up 29-14. Yeah, um, it's, it's been happening to the Riders a lot during this six-game slide. Uh I don't know if it's just Corey Mace is calling too soft of a zone, or if I or and they're noticing that, or if if Lacombo is not playing well enough in safety. Like we had last year, Jane Dalkey like trolling back there and and seemed to be pretty awesome. And then it seemed early the first game of the season he got a really dumb penalty, and it kind of seemed that either Mace benched him or is punishing him still. Like I don't know. He's healthy. He's playing special teams. I don't know why he's not back there. Um, we have Jackson Ford who's starting to practice now, so maybe, uh, maybe he can get in there. But uh, whatever, whatever is happening right now is not working for the Rider defense when it comes to the zone middle defense. Like, yeah, the 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 DBs are ball hawks and they're getting some interceptions, they're getting some great tackles, but they're not. They're they're letting up all these passing yards, and then yes, they are sometimes stopping him in the red zone. Winnipeg scored a lot more touchdowns than other teams have, so uh, I don't know. It, it was frustrating to to watch the Ryder defense, though, for sure. There were ebbs and flows like there are in any football game, and I think that's mm-hmm. what makes this game a classic. And I think, you know, <laughs> there were some good football games to watch this weekend. Now, the team started off by trading two and outs, and then Winnipeg scores the touchdown, nine plays, 89 yards. Strevler gets that ball in from the three, but then the Riders answer back with the touchdown, and then the momentum kind of swings their way because Marcus Sales picks off Zach Caleros. The Riders get the ball at a good part of the field, and they score a touchdown, Dante Myers. So the Riders had a 14-7 lead before the Nick Dembski touchdown that I mentioned, and that's when everything changed. It wasn't only because of the Dembski touchdown. It was because, and I don't like giving up. Uh, a single on a kickoff especially when you have the choice and that's what the riders did and it came back that that single point kind of bit them uh, at the end of the day because the next kick for the bombers ended up being a punt where it went off Alfred's hands and I know some people were kind of questioning his effort to get the ball afterwards Noah Hallett recovers it in the end zone. The Bombers have a 22-14 lead, and at that point, they had all the momentum. After two miscues, I thought, in a row, especially the touchdown given up on special teams. And like we said in the Ottawa-BC game, those special teams blunders are really hard to overcome. And, And this one was probably more serious than the ones that happened in the Ottawa game. Uh... But Alfred, it's not what you expect from him. Like, at the end of the day, (laughs) he's known, and I think he's got the reputation of being one of the top returners in the CFL. It was not his day on Sunday. No, and unfortunately this season there's been a lot more not his days than his days. Um, I know he's had one touchdown return this year. He's had a few long ones that have been called back on penalties. Um, but something's, yeah, that 
I was questioning his effort there too. He was just trying to to play it off like he didn't touch it, but even from He's... our seats in the upper deck, you definitely touched it. Uh, even the, the Ryder fans knew. <laughs> yeah, uh, and 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 if he would have just let the ball go in the end zone, it wouldn't have been a point because on kickoffs, if it goes straight through, it's not a point, right? Correct. I believe Correct. you you have to actually concede. Imagine if they did that when it was a, a field goal. Yeah. Uh, so he could have ran it out. So I, I really well, he could have ran it out, but he also could have just let the ball go through yeah. the end zone, yeah. and there wouldn't have been a point. But the other thing that really pissed me off, and we were talking about in the stands, at the end of the half, we could have got that point back. Brett Corsack, or not Brett, Adam Corsack, he can boom that ball. And we saw it late, and I know he was going in into the wind. There was a little bit of a wind there. But but he had a directional there, kick. Like, he intentionally yeah. kicked it to the sideline yeah. with four seconds to go. Yeah, and but they could have easily got that point back. And if they would have got that point back at the end of the game, they're kicking a, a field, they're kicking a convert to go to overtime, not having to worry about doing an onside kick and having Brett Lowther attempt a 60 yard kick. Uh, yeah, I, you know, we had some struggles on receivers too. You know, Bain was, Bain yeah. had a lot of drops. Uh, so honestly, here's, here's my plan or here's what I would do if I was Corey Mace. Alfred's sitting, He's sitting for a game or two because he's he needs to I think he needs to show it in practice that he can something's off. OK, maybe he's not getting pushed. I don't know. There was also a, a kick kickoff late in the game that he just let Bertrand Houdon take instead of him when, you know, you're the guy. You're the guy who's getting paid to return the kicks. Uh, so I'd sit him. I would take Bain out of the starting lineup for re- re- receivers and I'd have him return. Because he's fast, and maybe he can try to work his way back into the receivers. Because we have Don, we've Myers, we've Johnson, we have Stearns, who's been hot and cold this year. But we have a Joe, a Joe, who's done everything that's been asked of him. Uh, like we, we have a, a plethora, I would say, of receivers who can catch the ball, but some of them aren't right now. So, and that's killing the Riders. <laughs> Now I uh, um, I don't think that coaches coach this way in the CFL when at times I think that they should because that single point really makes a difference and who mm-hmm. knows maybe of course maybe maybe they had the conversation but they should have tried to get that single back at the end of the at the end of the first half like it and yeah. maybe it's just because we're armchair nerds you know talking about well, cfl but i really <laughs> don't think coaches think that way in the cfl when at times they should yeah especially these newer coaches like i think back in the day don matthews would have absolutely kicked that single point to get that point back we 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 saw him do it uh i and that's what I think that the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are missing. Like Corey Mace is doing, I'd say a really, I'd still say he's doing a really good job as a rookie head coach. But that's the thing. Like we have a bunch of young, young coaches. We saw this happen in BC a few years ago when Brendan Claybrooks took over there, and it did not work. Uh, so I'm kind of hopeful maybe in the off season that, you know, Jeremy O'Day or Craig Reynolds or whoever it has to be can talk to Mace and be like, Hey, you should probably get a veteran coach on your staff. And that veteran coach can maybe help him say, Hey, we have an opportunity to get a point here. There's, there's no, there was no negative. Like they could still cover it. You could still like, you're not gonna, there's no risk of, I guess there's a risk of giving up a big return, but they if they had a big return, unless they're scoring, they don't have time to make a play. So I think the risk-reward just didn't match up there. So I don't know. It's just frustrating when it seems that there's... When, when us fans sitting in the crowd can be like, before the play's even going, hey, we got to get a point here. We're not paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to coach <laughs> a team, right? We don't spend... 10 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours a day in the film room with game plans. Like we just know 
from watching football as fans that, hey, we gave up a single point. We need to get that point back because at the end of the game, that point could matter. And it did. And it did. Uh, and we'll we'll mention the last po- last possession of the first half for the Bombers as well was another key one. Because on the same play, first and 10, Rough Rider 33, Caleros tries to hit Lawler in the end zone. On the play, Miles Brown hits him late. Um, and Williams, the DB for the Riders, gets called uh, as a pass interference. Now, <laughs> with both of these happening on the same play, it was one of those things. Now, Miles Brown could have avoided, and he turned in. Does he meant to hit him? Um, so th- there's no debating. I don't. I don't think roughing the passer on that, obviously. But the, the PI, I thought <laughs> there could have been a conversation there. I kind of wonder. And then that would have put the ball at the 18 instead of the 1. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess, well, shoulda, coulda, woulda. I, I guess you'd rather have the defense at the 18 than the 1 to just see what could happen at that point. But uh, yeah. do, do you think coaches are kind of getting a little scared to challenge because they don't know what's going to come out of it? Because I, I thought maybe <laughs> that Mace... Yeah. Had a had a case to challenge the PI anyway. Well, I think so. And and earlier in the game, there was a a a, a pass to uh, to Keon Schaefer Baker where it looked like he was interfered with in goal. There was no call. Uh, I I know fans were wanting Mace to challenge there, but uh, yeah, I think this whole new clear and obvious when. <laughs> They're supposed to be calling things clear and obvious, but even they're not doing it clear and obvious. And so you're early in the game, you know, you know that there's a penalty, you know, it's going to be still be first and 18. I think a challenge would have been good there, but at the same time, we don't know. Like we saw in the Toronto game where (laughs) Ryan Dinwiddie threw the challenge flag, like even before the whistle went instantly and, and it, it did look at first, like live, it did to look me. live. Like, oh, that's yeah. PI. But then when you slowed it down, it, it like he didn't push right, so he kind of bumped into him a little bit. But there was no. I understand why they didn't overturn that because it wasn't clear and obvious. Yeah. yeah. So, but like you can see how Dinwiddie was right there, and he he. So he, now, how is he going to be like? Oh, what what can I challenge? Because I thought that was clear and obvious. So. So I do think coaches are getting a little gun shy um, with it, but um, end of the day, Miles Brown can't do that. This the other time he heard a quarterback, it was not his fault. This time he heard a quarterback, it was his fault. And and listen, I'm not trying to be a, a jerk or anything here, but I I know Zach has a history of concussions. I know he got hit helmet to helmet. It didn't look to me like it was harder than anybody like smashing each other. When players smash each other in the head after a good play, it looked about the same. And then, but the thing that kind of rattled me, I get, again, it should be a penalty. I, I wouldn't say dirty hit, but should be a penalty. He got up looking around for a penalty and then he goes down <laughs> and then he's taken out of the, like, it's just... I don't know. So Wade uh, Miller is the president yeah. for the Bombers, and he spoke with the Winnipeg Free Press after the game. And and I quote, he says, at some point, maybe our commissioner will decide that we should protect quarterbacks after the play. This is ridiculous and needs to stop. We've seen this two years in a row now. Was it last Labor Day Classic when Pete Robertson did the helmet to helmet thing with Zach? I, I think that was last yep. year. Um, yep. Man, that one was worse last year. It for was, sure. I agree. Yeah. Um, but at the I end didn't of the see, day, I didn't see Wade Miller saying anything about Shea Patterson getting hit by Big Hill. At the end of the but day, anywho. Zach, uh, he 
he got hurt and he, he left the game. Now there's conversation here about concussion protocol and things like that. And Mike O'Shea said that the, the decision to hold Zach out was precautionary. And he did not formally enter concussion protocol. Now, the thing is, I think if you go into concussion protocol, I think it's a minimum of seven days, meaning that he would be out of the banjo bowl. So to be. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of gamesmanship here. Of course there is. <laughs> and of course, Saturday uh, at the banjo bowl is going to be even more fired up because of moments like this and what happened in the stands after the game as well. Now, when the Riders came out of the room in the second half, they had the momentum. Like, uh, Strevler was struggling, and he missed some makeable throws in this one. But the Riders, they couldn't really get the offense moving until the fourth quarter because the third quarter, they had some lengthy drives that ended in field goals. And and then the O-line injuries come in for the Riders, and I yeah. thought with Micah Johnson having to switch to offense, then Oliveira started getting chunks of yards because Micah wasn't up the middle of the defense. Now, well done to Micah Johnson for being able to switch sides of the ball, but it did hurt them a little bit on defense without having number four out there. So there was some gamesmanship happening <laughs> and, and noticing yeah. moving pieces, but two more offensive linemen having to leave for the riders. Like, uh, man, the, the numbers just keep adding up there. At some point, you just got to run out of guys, and and that's what happened in this one. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating the amount of O-line injuries because – that's it seems to be the Achilles heel of this of this team uh and it just keeps happening every single year you think you have an o-line everyone goes down uh it's frustrating but at the same time like even with us down to Micah Johnson at o-line I I I still feel like the offensive line did a really good job in this game uh I I I don't have it right in front of me, but I think Harris only got sacked a couple of times, if that. Uh, I know Willie Jefferson had his stupid hands up in the air, and he just... <laughs> he took it offside, just, too. <laughs> he did, yeah. Yeah, the Willie special. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, like, I, I, I'm i struggling to try to find the positives because, you know, we're in... The Riders are in a, a six-game skid, and it just... It just reminds you of the past two years after Labor Day, but now this is happening going into Labor Day, and so... Well, it's not a rider podcast, but the positives are that they were able to move the ball, and Myers yep. and Johnson uh, have yep. exploded onto the scene, and Harris was able to find them and fight mm -hmm. back into this game. I know fighting and being close, none of it counts at the end of the day, um, but they... <laughs> Made it entertaining, at least for the fans. Like, yeah, and they, made our blood pressure spike and fall and spike. <laughs> so then, yeah, then that end of the game where the Riders score a touchdown with 15 seconds left, and then they go for the two points. So this is where the single given up before uh, really came into play. And I thought Harris had time. Clearly, he didn't. He made an errant throw, and uh, yeah. it, it was picked off. But then they recover the the onside kick, and there is life again when the Bombers take a pass interference penalty that was re-spotted twice. So when they first spotted it, it was going to be a 52-yard field goal. <laughs> and then they pushed it back. It ended up being a 60-yarder. So I don't think we can be mad at Brett Lothar for that. I know there are probably some that are, but uh, that is a mammoth, no. mammoth field goal. But, uh, hey, Sergio Castillo kicked from 56 yards. He was dynamite in this one. And I know that I kind of, you know, said Strevler... Uh, missed some throws and he did but man when he hit Dembski uh, on that uh, last drive where the Bombers got their last field goal 
that was a tight throw and then there was another mm-hmm. big throw he made he hit Dembski a couple times in the second half so he did made the throws he needed to make that's and that's what the bombers yeah. do and that's what they have yep. done for the past 4 years they make the plays in the clutch to win and that's what they did on labor day yeah. and now <laughs> The writers have to head back there uh, for the Banjo Bowl. But, man, I I guess it does feel like it's got to be talked about. Um, There was a fight in the stands. And let's face it, there were probably more than one fight in the stands. Um, I love Mm -hmm. when away fans just show up en route. To another stadium. I love when the riders do it in Calgary and Edmonton and Winnipeg. I love it. And it's too bad. Like I uh I've lived in Alberta now. Uh I went to college in 2007 uh and I haven't left Alberta really since then. Um but it blows my mind when I go to Edmonton and those people act like Calgary is such a far trip. It's not. I really no. wish that more Edmonton fans would invade McMahon Stadium and vice versa and things like that. But this yeah. is the best Bomber fan turnout in Regina, I think, in a long time. And I know that they have the 5 o'clock kickoff for TV purposes. But you know what that is? That's a lot of time for these people to get beers into them, alcohol in them. And, for, and I know people... <laughs> people need to be adults they need to be accountable for what they're consuming and how they're acting after consuming said things um mm-hmm. but when a player wants this sort of reward now we don't know what happened in the seconds before the video but the rider fan pushes the bomber fan the bomber fan fights the rider fan and then it gets all broken up but a uh, tough look for w- Lucky Whitehead to <laughs> want to offer a beer uh, to the Bomber fans that was getting into some fights at the Labor Day Classic. Uh, I think there's a fine coming for that tweet. Yeah, that's that's PR like 101. You don't tweet that. You you leave that stuff alone. Uh, that's it's a bad look. It doesn't matter if the Ryder fan started it or if the Bomber fan started it before then. Like, it doesn't matter. These are grown men who shouldn't be fighting. And sh- and, and even, you know, people, the guys who are trying to break it up and then they get punched and then they start swinging. And it's yeah. just, it's just, it's stupid. I had, <laughs> I had a very nice lady think that I was involved and, <laughs> and saying I was good for, for breaking up the, the fight, but I, that was not me. Uh, I guess I had a lookalike there. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a bad look for everyone. And then you have people on, on, on Twitter and Facebook, you know, saying, oh, this is why Ryder fans have a bad, like it's enough of that. It's the 5%. I tweeted it out. It's the, it's the 5% bad that everyone paints with a broad stroke and then labels an entire fan base. Listen, every fan base has idiots. Every, you know, there were fans in hamilton that were fighting toronto argonauts players once does that mean that hamilton fans are all bad no it doesn't it means some drunk idiots that were wearing a hamilton jersey were bad uh so let's just remember that just because you have an allegiance to a fan doesn't mean that all other fan bases are bad just because one little thing on any internet gets shown that's i wish it didn't happen but you know, I can only control myself when I go into a stadium. I can't control the other 33,000 people that are there. Hey, it's clearly late in the game. Um, so, hey, we don't know what happened in the previous two and a half hours. Things boil yeah. over. And that's... Yeah. And I guess what I think about is that there's going to be Winnipeg fans that see that and then see Ryder fans come to their stadium on Saturday and the temperature is just going to stay that high. Um, I don't even yep. know how you cool it off. Like, I, I actually... <laughs> well, not, not especially when a player is stoking the fire. Yeah, yeah. Now, I uh, I was never a part of fistfights, 
but I have been to some pretty intense Calgary games, home to the Rough Riders, and I've heard families say that they don't want to take their kids to a Labor Day game, and I don't blame them, man. And they won't take their kids to when the Riders come to Calgary and things like that because things just get crazy. The amount of security and police presence that they have had at McMahon Stadium for that, I didn't see that same thing in Regina. Like, I don't no. know. Like, it looked like they were going at it for a long time, and nobody was there to to stop it. So maybe this is yeah. a consideration that uh, going forward uh, has to be has to be looked at. But hey, it sucks we're talking about it's, this. <laughs> well, yeah, but it, it is it is a bad look for the rider organization for not having the property proper security in there. Uh, it, there was a few things in, in Regina. We have this stupid Facebook meme page called Just Bins, and it has a bunch of you know. It just shows all the bunch of stupid stuff in the city, and and the Ryder Bomber game was all over it, and and that's just not good PR, especially when you see security guards absent, uh, and and that was really close to the field. There should have been a security yeah. guard on the field looking up at them. Uh, calling on a radio to get somebody down there, like it's just and it, a bad it look. looked like there was people, but <laughs> I don't know. It felt like they were too far away. Like yeah. I've I've been to these games in Calgary and Edmonton when you know it gets towards the end of the fourth quarter, and then all of a sudden there's a little bit more vests and mm-hmm. uniforms yeah. showing up and being prepared. And uh, yeah, it, and it's sad that in a stadium full of adults that we have to prepare for that, but we do. Um, yep. And, hey, hopefully the Badger Bowl goes down without incident, but I have a <laughs> sneaky suspicion that that might be the dumbest thing I've said all week. <laughs> yeah. I, I also, before we move on to the next game, I do want to point out something that I thought was quite funny. Uh, at near the end of the game, when when Harris was was sneaking for that touchdown and, and initially got called short, and then they announced that the command center was interjecting, oh. <laughs> and just all the boos, and then it turns out to give the Riders a touchdown. I yeah. thought that was pretty hilarious because you know you could you could just tell how how much the rider faithful thinks about the command center after the past few games, which in some cases I can understand, but some cases, you know, it is what it is. Labor day magic at Tim Hortons field as the tie cats beat the Argos 31 28 and Bo Levi Mitchell on labor day, apparently (laughs) is undefeated special. He was undefeated in Calgary as the starting quarterback and he's now undefeated in Hamilton as the starting quarterback yeah. on Labor Day and it's really simple as this how the game started for mm-hmm. the Cats. I mean Chad Kelly gets picked off on his second pass by Richard Leonard and then two plays later it's a 57 yard touchdown to Tim White and then you know the next possession Bo, he, he he's running like he had a 14 yard rush himself and then they get Talia Tagovailoa on the roster for the Ticats and I know Ticat fans have been wondering when are we going to see this guy he was kind of hyped up when they brought him in and hey there's another mobile athlete in the in the backfield he scored that second Touchdown for the Tie Cats to put him up thirteen nothing before the extra point. Were were you kind of surprised to see him getting on the roster I, like that? Well, I wasn't surprised with Powell getting hurt, but I, I thought it was cool, you know, him coming in there, getting his first touch as a CFL quarterback and scoring a touchdown on his first yeah. first touch there. That was pretty cool. But um, he he came as advertised because uh, they even ran that play later in the game like that they would have ran uh, at his college with only the three old linemen right in the middle yeah. there. So that was pretty uh, that was pretty cool to see too, uh, seeing Scott dig into his playbook there. But, uh, you know, hopefully, l- listen, we all know that, that Bo's time in Hamilton is coming to an end at the end of the season. Uh, it's been pretty clear that uh, that Powell is Scott Milanovic's guy, but you know, if you have a guy like like uh, Tagalovolia back there, uh, 
future's bright for uh, for short yardage, at least, uh, going <laughs> forward in, in Hamilton. Now, there have been many times where <laughs> the, the riders and the Ticats have both kind of sucked going into Labor Day, and they, they've both kind of won. And then the fans yeah. just have this hope, and they have this belief that they're coming back. And in many cases, the very next game, it all comes crashing down to earth. So, I yep. mean, the Ticats are now on by. Uh, their next game is against the Red Blacks on the 14th. If... And and it's a shame. It's a shame that it's not a back-to-back at least. I know. I agree. It's a shame. If they can carry that into that game against Ottawa and win that, I know even if they do win that, they'd only be 4-9. and nine. So the playoffs are, I think right now, a long shot, obviously, um, for the Ticats. And I don't have the math on it, but the probability <laughs> is quite low. Um but hey, maybe Milanovic is saving his job, and uh, you know, uh, Bo is auditioning for somebody uh, in twenty twenty five. I'll take him for Labor Day next year. <laughs> Sign him once a year on uh, yep. on Labor Day. Yep. Um, so, and then the Argos they they're able to answer back with a field goal. So it's, you know, 14-3. Well, guess what? The next play, a 70-yard touchdown <laughs> to Tim White, 21-3 for the Thai Cats. So the rest of the way, the Thai Cats were only able to score, you know, uh, 10 more points. Mm-hmm. But um, that first half, that, that's the reason. That the Ticats yep. won. And we talk about the momentum, the way it ebbs and flows, because the Argos, they never were out of this game. They, they, they mm-hmm. chipped away at that lead. They kicked field goals. And, you know, by the end of the first half, it's like, I don't know if Hamilton has this in the bag, despite being up by 18 at one point. Yeah, I agree. I thought that uh, I thought that Hamilton was kind of pissing it away there as the game was going on, just because... Uh, like they got to Chad Kelly initially, uh, quite well. The crowd did too. I heard some no means no chance. <laughs> <laughs> it was good to hear. Uh, and, uh, and you know, when, when Kelly was running around, he was, he was getting hit. He wasn't sliding that, that, that hit on the two point convert attempt yeah. that they initially ruled, ruled in, but then reviewed it. Um, <laughs> It's funny that he started sliding after that. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, he, he still, he was able to find uh, the, the receivers downfield. They had a lot, they had some good explosion plays and got right back in there. Um, but it's like, it's just something about Bo on, on Labor Day. He was able to still steal the deal at the end there. And, uh, you know, it, good for him. Uh, good for the fans in Hamilton to actually get a, a big win there, and and like you said, like let's fa- let's face it, that's Hamilton's Grey Cup this year is is winning Labor Day because they they are able to not only defeat their their rivals but also you know stick it to Chad Kelly, which I think a lot of fans were hoping to do, and uh, you know hopefully like you said they can build onto it and and keep kind of going and 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 just finding out which pieces for the puzzle will hopefully be able to get them on the ground running next season yeah you know they just wanted to make life difficult for the Argos to have another home playoff game and uh hey the, yeah. the Ticats did that uh they they make it difficult um for the Argos to, to do that hey they're gonna have to win some games down the stretch but the Argos they, they end up getting the lead back uh 28 27 um, but the wind was, I, I guess, kind of going crazy in this one. And Constantinu, he has a 74-yard punt single to tie the game up. And the uh, uh, Thai Cats end up tying up this game or taking the lead with a field goal. And another display at the end of the game. I know it didn't end up in a touchdown, but that mm-hmm. throw that Bo hit Brendan O'Leary orange with for 48 yards to ice it. Mm-hmm. It's like this guy clearly has ball in him, you know, mm-hmm. and didn't turn the ball uh, yeah. over. It's like, 
how do you channel Labor Day for this guy every day of the season? <laughs> yeah, and and that was the thing because you could tell that that like the the Hamilton offense did kind of sputter there in the second half, they and did. and and Ryan Dinwiddie felt comfortable enough to not gamble and to kick the ball back to them with about two minutes left on the clock. And then, you know, like you said, Hamilton was able to, they were running the clock and then it was set. They even had, uh, had Tagliavoli in there running yeah. some of the, the, the short yardage offense just to run the clock, which, you know, that was a ballsy call in itself, having a guy in his first CFL game with the game on the line there, ha- being able to run out the clock. But then, like you said, they got to second and seven and, and, you know, they needed to get that first down to keep going and, and Bo just chucks it up there and heck of a catch, you know, and then they do the right thing by not running up the score and just, just kneeling it out and getting out of there. It was, uh, it was, it was good to see. And other than the, other than that early interception, Chad Kelly had a good game, man. So the, the Argo offense, they were good, uh, you know, 24-30, 322 yards, a touchdown and a pick. You go to Bo, 20-30, of 30, 347, two touchdowns. Uh, the Tim White, six catches, nine targets. Uh, nice. 180 yards, two touchdowns. I actually think this is a few years in a row now where – Tim White has had a bit of a slower start, and then you look at the body of work at the end of the season, and it's like, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> do the stats matter as much? Like, when you look at a full season's worth, if they come when you're out of the playoffs and six games under 500, I guess they all count. Uh, he's well, still getting paid, but still. Yeah, he's not getting paid as much as he wanted to uh, at the yeah. beginning of the, the free it's agency true. there, but... Um, that's, that's the thing when you're on a team that's not able to, to make playoffs and get that playoff money, you got to be performing as best you can so that you can try to get some of that extra money next season when the, when it's time to resign or sign with a new club. David Ungerer ended up being the leading receiver for the Argos, four catches, 78 yards. But Devaris Daniels had seven catches for 74, DeMonte Coxey, six for 67 and then you look at Greg Bell for the Tie Cats, nine carries, seventy-eight yards, and uh, four catches for forty yards. So I, I, I don't know. Maybe they found a running back that they prefer. I, I know some people think James Butler has been dealing with injuries since training camp, but the injury report was saying healthy scratch. And mm-hmm. if you're paying a guy that much money, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Is he? I don't know. I don't think you can get much for running backs. As far as trades go, but uh, oh, yeah. that's an interesting moment for the uh, you know the Tie Cats roster construction. You look at what the Elks did; they got all three of their yeah. running backs onto the roster, but Hamilton not doing it with Butler anyway. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, he's pretty dynamic when he's in there. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there are some other teams that would love a, a, a running back with his caliber, but you're not, you're definitely not going to trade for running backs that are a dime a dozen. So, uh, all due but respect. It's yeah, all due. Of course, I I just mean I know that I know what you're it's easy to find one. Uh, it's just, but it it, it is kind of frustrating seeing a guy who has shown that he can run the ball still this year. It's not like, yeah. so you wonder, you wonder if it's something off the field. You wonder if it's just Milanovic just taking to another player, like in the same situation where he's taking to Powell instead of Bo. I, I'm not sure. Like Milanovic is making some pretty interesting choices and some of them work out. Some of them, you know, <laughs> fall flat on their face when an injury happens and you have to resort to go back to your other quarterback. But, <laughs> uh, they seem to be making. They made it work today, so I guess he's the smart guy today. How about those Ed- Edmonton Elks, Sheldon? Thirty-five wow. twenty, a victory over the Calgary Stampeders. Now <laughs> we had Stamps fans uh, crapping on you for picking the Elks, despite praising them after a bye and praising them, you know, on Labor Day. But I, and you hi, know Darren. <laughs> You were correct. Now, (laughs) the Stamps are on by, 
The Labor Day game isn't until Monday, so the Stamps had a long break uh, coming into this one. The fact that they weren't in sync on offense, and actually the, the Elks could have had a bigger lead in the first half, like... It was five nothing, and that that it could have been a lot worse uh, for the Elks in this one. But as the game went on, I mean, the Stamps' defense clearly ran out of gas. They couldn't stop anything. Like the Elks were getting twelve yards of play. Like they were all over them. But early yeah. in the game, it the, the, look Jake Mayer threw four interceptions. I don't want to call out a guy. Ish Hyman had a rough game at receiver. <laughs> like, Mayer, he looked like he had a big completion in the bag. And May- Hyman runs over the guy, forces an incompletion. Then the first interception that uh, Mayer threw, Hyman steps out of bounds. He. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm on my couch, you know, taking Advil to get my back to feel all right. So, I, I you know, I, I can only talk so much. But And then there was the other interception where clearly the receiver could have caught it. And then it just bounces in the air and, and Edmonton mm-hmm. gets a hold of it. But I thought 81 had a rough game for the Stamps. Um, but it almost looked like an offense that... You'd expect to see in week one. It's almost like they did nothing to improve during the layoff. That that has to be disappointing for Stamps fans. For sure, and 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 Stamps fans are used used to winning, like ninety percent of their games coming off a bye. Uh, so and and I know the Elks are are playing a lot better than they were at the beginning of the season, but I think there's a lot of stamp fans with how well they were playing like up until you know the last game at home they were undefeated at home now they've lost two in a row at home three in a row total uh they're they're trending down edmonton is trending up and uh it's <laughs> this next game in edmonton is a huge game now just just like for the riders it's a huge game for the riders going into enemy territory well, now it's the same thing for Calgary going into Edmonton uh, because if if either of these teams get swept in these series, that's that's just pretty much disastrous for playoffs or for home field advantage or whatever. So uh, Calgary's got to turn it around real quick here because they they don't look good on the road and and you know Jake Mayer he can't he can't throw four interceptions again uh, and it's just. I don't know. I I, I want to be wrong about Jake. I want quarterback play to be well or to be good in the CFL. I want, uh, I know I'm an anybody but Calgary kind of guy, but I want the teams to succeed. I want the teams to perform. I want fans to be able to go and see players play well. This is just very uncharted territory for, for Calgary Stampeders fans because there's always been that next quarterback who comes in and just seamlessly takes over and seamlessly seems to dominate. And this is the first time since Jeff Garcia <laughs> that the quarterback change did not work out for them. Uh, so it's it's very it's got to be very frustrating for Stamps fans. I now do wonder if that leash is getting really short now. I I actually can't... I don't think I can describe how big of a win this was for Edmonton. Uh, They don't win Labor Day very often. And I know there's still four games under five hundred, But if they beat Calgary on Saturday, which now, like you said, the the Stamps on the road this year, 0-5... Look, the Elks are one and four at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, yeah, I mean, the confidence after going on the road to McMahon Stadium, all the momentum is in Calgary's favor as the series sh- ships back to Edmonton on Saturday. And now the Riders have to be worried because <laughs> Edmonton smashed Saskatchewan in Regina just a few weeks mm-hmm. ago. And Edmonton is going to be hosting Saskatchewan first Saturday in October. 
So if Edmonton sweeps Calgary here, they are going to move Calgary down to last in the West. And I know Saskatchewan has the tie. I really don't see Saskatchewan winning the banjo pull. Both Edmonton and Saskatchewan would have five wins and they play again in a few weeks. <laughs> we got to watch for the series. Elks, man. Yeah, yeah. you're for the yeah. season series. We got to watch for the Elks, man. I I don't know if they're a team that I want to be playing currently. Now, especially especially with McLeod Bethel Thompson actually performing now, and 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 not just him performing, but the defense performing as at the same time. Because early in the season he was able to show out, he was able to perform, but the defense just held, hang hung him out to dry. But ever since Chris Jones left, and 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 Jason Shivers was able to get, I guess maybe get more of his own stuff in there, I'm not sure. But as soon as he left, it just seems like the defense started to click. And Well, I think this was the best their defensive line has looked. I think it was the best game Oakman has had as an elk. Mm-hmm. They yeah. made life difficult for Kylan Hill. I'm not crying. I'm just choking on something. So take over for a sec. Uh <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, they were able to get the pressure. They were able to force Jake to throw those uh, those four interceptions. And, you know, like you said, a couple of them were bounces where they could have went the other way, but a couple of them were just overthrows. Like that one to Purifoy way down in the, in the zone there. Like I know that's yeah. like a long punt kind of thing, but it's still, it still takes away momentum. It still hushes your crowd. Uh, I, and I know I believe on that possession – Edmonton wasn't able to do anything with it, but it, you know you can't you can't let a team force four interceptions on you and and think that you're going to be able to overcome that and and because now Jake goes into Edmonton, he's got that in his head like I I can't do I can't force the ball, but I have to force the ball because I can't like it's just and like you said maybe he has a shorter leash, but at the same time like. We've seen Tommy Stevens come in there and and be dynamite in short yardage, but we haven't seen what he can do with the full offense and and having to actually throw the ball more than maybe one or twice once or twice. So uh, I don't know how short of a leash you actually can have with Mayer right now. Yeah, I. That's true. We don't know, you know, what they're seeing in the guys. You know, behind them, there there's Bonner who came into the game at mm, the true. at I the end of it. I don't know if <laughs> they want to make that move or not, but I mean, they couldn't run the ball. Kylan Hill had six carries for 21 yards, so th- they really got away from that. Um, they they were just shutting it down. And you mentioned McLeod Bethel Thompson. Now this is crazy. I. <laughs> we talk about the ebbs and flows of a game, but what about the ebbs and flows of a season? Now, if Trey Ford's 100%, I, you got to keep McLeod in there. And I, I don't think that was a sentence that I would have said 10 days ago. Yeah. Um, it <laughs> It's so weird because you don't, you don't want to see a guy lose a spot because of injury, but at the same time, you got to go with the hot hand here. You got to go with the guy who's winning games. And, and I know Trey came in and he, he beat the riders and, and was doing well in the first half of that next game. But then when he got hurt, the cloud just seamlessly took over. And, and it's like maybe before he had so much pressure on him with, with everyone, all the fan bo- fan base chanting that they want Trey Ford, you know, booing the offense at home sometimes, Maybe that was just too much pressure on the guy, but now he saw, you know, Trey go in there, do well, and then he was able to go in there and do well, and now maybe he's like, hey, I can I can kind of silence my critics, and, and we're rolling now. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's, you need to have that one-two punch to win. You know, BC's going to have that when, uh, when Vernon Adams is healthy. Uh, you know, if... If Taylor Powell wasn't 
wasn't injured. I guess Hamilton would have that. I guess, but they don't really, they don't really have a place to go here. But I don't know. <laughs> that, that's a tough decision for Jarius Jackson whether to go back to Trey Ford or to roll with McLeod. Uh, you gotta, you gotta figure it out. <laughs> yeah, that that's a tough one. It, it it feels weird to say, but I have to assume that. McLeod's leash is quite short. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't know if maybe, and I know that the two quarterback thing, I think fans think that it'll work well, but I also think that it'll just take the rhythm and the flow away from your starter. So to just tough. switch it up like that, I think it's really tough to make that work. Um, Winnipeg did it, and they have done it with at times with Strevler and Caleros, and maybe they could make it happen with Trey, where he comes in on a second and one and stays in for a few plays or something like yeah. that. But yeah, um, yeah, those are <laughs> tough decisions down the stretch for Edmonton. Now we'll talk about the key. I think the fourth quarter in this game was pretty crazy. Um, so. The Purifoy interception. Now, he had two. So, the one that he caught on the three and ends up going out of bounds. And I said to my wife, I said, well, it's kind of like a punt for Calgary. Um, Obviously, they they would have rather come away with three points. But Mm -hmm. to keep him or them pinned that deep, it's like, all right. Now, the next play is an incomplete. But the play after that, they hit Geno Lewis who fumbles it, and then it gets recovered for Tevin Jones. (laughs) Yeah. Takes it 81 yards to the Calgary 1. Like, what a turn of events. What a play. (laughs) You talk about things that are deflating for a defense. Man, you had them have to go 107 yards, and they did. Yeah, and and just the the high and low of the crowd too of seeing a fumble and see and hoping that you're gonna get it and then just seeing that, yeah, no, that just that's that's going all the way and and Tevin Jones just on a tear <laughs> on a is, tear yeah. like it's unreal. Uh, yeah, I once a rider, so I'm happy for the guy. <laughs> I'm happy for the guy. You but see that little peace awesome. sign he does with yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Good for him. Now, the next drive for Calgary ends, you guessed it, in an interception. Uh, mm-hmm. Edmonton doesn't do anything with that. But when they punt it, Peyton Logan takes it 104 yards to the house. All of a sudden, they're only down by seven with three minutes to go in this game. <laughs> What do the Elks do but hit Tevin Jones for a 73-yard touchdown? So as soon as the Stamps got any morsel of hope, the Elks with several daggers in this one to hold the Stamps down on the Labor Day Classic. Like, I don't know. This Edmonton team, (laughs) they're a tough bunch. Yeah, it was it was funny because after that fumble, I was we were over at uh, my wife's aunt and uncle's place for for supper, and I I saw the fumble and the touchdown, and I went to go to the washroom, and I was I, I sent out a tweet, hey, you know, if I can't see the Riders win on Labor Day, at least I'll take a Calgary loss, and then I got some responses because that's when Bait and Logan returned that Ooh. touchdown, <laughs> and and so you know it's like oh it's not over yet, and then you know. When I saw Tevin Jones get that other touchdown, I sent out the Vince Carter, it's over, gif. And, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> but, but just crazy. Like, just like the Ryder game, it's just like the the crazy highs and lows and momentum and roller coaster. And, and that's what we love about the CFL. Like, yeah, yeah. That stuff doesn't happen in the NFL very often. And, and I know on Thursday the new season starts, and that's cool and all. But you never see that exciting stuff in there. So, and that's I, the I, craziest I, thing about Labor Day, like mm-hmm. because it's playoff atmosphere. Hamilton mm-hmm. is two and eight. They probably don't have a playoff game. Labor Day was like a playoff game. Yeah. <laughs> and they got the win. Yeah, I mean, 
it's it's just crazy what happens on this weekend. It's so so special, so so special. And we talk about the Elks. <laughs> oh my god! I'm, like, I'm looking at the stats. They should have popped fifty. They like they really yeah. could have. But that first half, they they started kind of slow. Um, McLeod Bethel Thompson, four hundred and eighty six yards passing, twenty five of thirty six. That's a sixty nine percent completion percentage. Nice. He could have had 500 easily. And he didn't get any of the, he didn't get credit for the fumble yards. Right. Oh, on the, I don't, true. I don't think he got, so that's like true. he could have got 600 maybe if he yeah. would have had a couple, not like. That's geez. true. <laughs> Curly Gittens Jr. 115 yards receiving. Geno Lewis, 112 yards receiving and a touchdown. Tevin Jones, five catches, 208 yards, two touchdowns. Yeah, I know Trey Roberson went down for the stamps in this game, and I don't know if that one loss, clearly the leader of the secondary, affected the rest of the secondary. But that's just a brutal performance for the Stampeders, and I know that there are fans there that just want that win on Labor Day, and they didn't get it. So this one really really is going to hurt for that team and it just feels like sometimes in many ways fans hope that a win on labor day can change the fortunes of a season this almost feels like this could be the beginning and maybe it's already started a downward spiral for the stamps the the rest of the season that playoff streak i think is in it's in jeopardy Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Uh, and we've thought it could be in jeopardy for a few years now, and they seem to pull yeah. it out in the end. So I'm not counting them out. One last thing about McLeod Bethel Thompson, which is kind of funny. I I had a terrible week in fantasy. I had Zach Claros as my quarterback. I was talking with Tammy about it, and she told me that she had McLeod Bethel Thompson the day before. And I was like, ooh, I, I don't know if that's going to work out for you. I hope it does, but I don't know. Yeah, it, it worked out for her. She got like almost 150 points in fantasy this week. Wow, so. nice. Uh, she she doubled me in fantasy, so she is far smarter than me this week when it comes to fantasy. Uh, I had myself an 150-point week, but I'm not showing off because I've sucked the rest of the time. <laughs> uh, I had Nathan Rourke as my captain, mm, and uh, I had nice. Tim White. Nice. So, <laughs> Oh, there you go. But, wow. But, but now it's like, man, I, I want to pick Tevin Jones. Like, <laughs> this guy. Is and Gino, well, I had Reggie Bagleton, yeah. so I would have liked to have, have a score, but Bagleton had seven catches, 118 yards himself, so that was another, yeah. you know, a, a good addition uh, mm-hmm. to my team. I mean, that's the bright spot for the Stamps. It, it's Reggie Bagleton, it's uh, the big play for Jalen Philpot. Uh, he had a 44 mm-hmm. yarder, uh, he had 75 yards overall. Um, that's and, and the 57 yarder for Paredes. That was an impressive field goal. I mean, those are the bright spots for the Stamps. And d- do you think that the Elks are going to go back to BD or are they going to go with Faithful? I'm, I'm a fan of Dean Faithful. He had a miss um, in this one, but I think when people know what BD's getting paid. Th- the expectations are up here, man, and there's a lot more that comes with that. There is, um, but I'm pretty sure they need to make the decision right away because that cut down, I think, is right mm. away if it hasn't already passed. Um, but I think it was ten games actually. So I think, yeah, so I, yeah. I think it is gone. But you know, that's the thing that a team needs to do when their kicker is struggling. They need to be able to show the kicker that, you know it's not just a gimme that you're on this roster and 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 for him to be the definitely the highest paid kicker in the league he needs to be hitting you know a lot more than he is uh we saw it in Ryder in Ryderville with Brett Lowther having that really brutal game but he's kind of he's come back like nobody as you said before nobody can put that 60 yarder on him for that miss other than that he's been money since that game so he he took that bad game and he was able to turn it around. Whereas Beatty, he's had multiple bad games and multiple, you know, costing wins 
You don't want to say that, but it, it, it's true. Uh, so I, I've always thought that Dean Faithful was a really good kicker and a really good PR kind of guy for the for the team. Uh, and you need to have a global player, so it, it just kind of makes sense to have him on there. And the global players don't make mo- don't make a lot of money, unfortunately, for them. But for a team, you can save some money there, especially if he's performing. And and as long as you understand, you know, we're not going to put him out there for the 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 Sergio Garcia or or Castillo, sorry, Sergio or the the Rene Paradis level of 57, 58 yarders, you're just not going to, you're not going to put that on Dean faithful. But I, if I was Edmonton, I would stick with him, but you, you, you can't just waste all the money that you're paying BD. So I think you kind of have to go back to him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're paying a guy, you got to play him. I, I'm kind of of that obviously belief too, yeah. unless it gets really, really bad. And I guess maybe at times yeah. it was really, really bad. Um, now, I'm just looking at the standings, man. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers are first in the West at 6-6. Six and six. There are two teams in the West, Sheldon, that have above 500 records against their own division. Do you think you know who those two are? Edmonton and yep. Winnipeg. Correct. First and last in the division, but the only two teams that have winning records against the West. Now, Winnipeg's four and three, Edmonton's three and two. If they both win their return matchups uh, coming up here this weekend, then yeah. And I, I think that is big for playoff positioning. Obviously, you have to win inside your division. The only team that's above 500 against their own division in the East. Montreal Alouettes. Uh, Ottawa is yeah. only one and one. So that means Ottawa's got a lot more games inside their division coming up down the stretch. We're going to find out what they're made of, right? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. It, it, because I think a lot of people are still shocked by Ottawa's record. They're like, what? Seven, three, and one? Well, mm-hmm. now they play Montreal next week uh, or at the end of the month, they play Saskatchewan. Uh, So, sorry, Ottawa plays Montreal in a couple weeks here. Ottawa plays Toronto this weekend, which is a massive game this weekend. BC plays Montreal on Friday, which is a very intriguing game. Um, Week 14 in the CFL, the stories continue. That wraps up Labor Day. Sometimes I get concerned we get a little too detailed and talk a little too much about the games, but... Man, the, the passion is there. We're fighting in the stands, so we might as well talk about it on the show uh, as adults. Well, no, nah, I am very juvenile at times, too. Uh, Sheldon, to, to wrap this up, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the power rankings. Let's just wrap up the show with that because we have a new number nine. We do. We Okay, let me pull this up here. I should have been ready. Okay, I'm just going to rattle through them. No real explanations. Uh, Montreal, Winnipeg, Ottawa, Edmonton, BC, Toronto, Hamilton, Calgary, Saskatchewan. Whoa. I thought you were putting Calgary last, honestly. No. Uh, You know, Calgary's lost three in a row. They haven't been winless in their last six. So uh, I think, yeah, the Riders, they went from first place to third place in one game. They haven't been able to do anything since June, July, whenever it was. <laughs> uh, no, they are they are playing as the worst team in the league right now and uh, can only go up from here. No, I don't know. (laughs) After Labor Day, the last two seasons, I'm not so convinced. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, me neither. That wraps up a wild Labor Day weekend Uh, for me. I put on the miles, man. You did. But I'm going to upload this and uh, get some sleep and hopefully not be uh, 
relying on ibuprofen for a little while, but uh, <laughs> that's all right. I might have to load up on it to go to the Calgary Edmonton game uh, this weekend. <laughs> I'll do what I got to do, man. You can rate, review, and subscribe to Two and Out on your favorite podcatcher. Uh, you can check out the show on YouTube as well. Leave a like, a subscription, a comment there. We're nearing 600 subscribers. That is so, so cool. So whether you're from Malaysia, uh, from Nova Scotia, or from Yellowknife, uh, check us out on YouTube or well, Pennsylvania. We'll give a shout out to our Pennsylvania listeners. I, <laughs> we enjoyed your state back in April. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we did. <laughs> do all that good stuff. To an out.ca to buy merch and support the show on Patreon. We will talk to you later this week, getting you ready for the Labor Day return matchups. <laughs>